Welcome to Champagne Problems. We're your hosts, Robbie Shaw and Charlotte Cameron. Thank you for joining us on this journey as we explore our mental health, well-being, performance, and longevity, and how our relationships with alcohol can influence each. No shame, no labeling, no judgment, just curiosity. Welcome back, all you sensational people. We have our first return guest on today, and we're very excited. We graciously welcome back Dr. Lisa Demore. If you haven't already heard her first episode with us, go back now. Dr. Demore is one of the brightest and most passionate people in the world of parenting today. She's written multiple bestsellers, has her own podcast called Ask Lisa, and speaks publicly and privately in the most esteemed of settings. And I have to just mention this. About a year ago, we were dealing with some stuff with our own child. Standard parenting stuff, but we were at a loss. I reached out to Dr. Demore, and she took my call. We talked it through, and she helped me tremendously. If that doesn't speak to the type of human Dr. Demore is, I don't know what does. Dr. Lisa Demore, welcome back to Champagne Problems. Thank you for having me back. Of course, of course. We are very honored that you agreed to come back on. You know, your your episode was is still one of our highest performing and one of our most enjoyable just because we do have a lot of parents as listeners. Um, so great to have you back. We do things a little different now that we've uh, we've we've expanded. Um, we 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 do a rapid fire question. A uh, series of questions. So we're going to kind of get to know you real quick, even though we kind of do, but we're going to get to know you a little better here. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready. I think I am. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. You're as ready as you can be, I promise. No. Uh, what was your first live music concert and where? I think it was Crosby, Stills, and Nash in the late summer of 1988. I had just graduated from high school and I was headed off to college. I grew up in Colorado and I have actually, as I describe it, I get goosebumps. I have very vivid memories of being at that concert and watching the sunset over the mountains and having this really powerful experience about like saying goodbye to Colorado and, and oh, going to college. Wow. That's amazing. God, what a description. Any, any chance that was at Red Rocks? It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> Though I did also see stuff at Red Rocks, but this was actually out somewhere else like it, I can't remember exactly but it was it was I just know it was pointed west and you could see mm. the sun going down wow that sounds great what food is your guilty pleasure oh well I mean I really like chocolate and you know the thing is it's not that bad for you but it's really what I love I mean I, I eat it every day multiple times <laughs> I, my favorite lovely yeah. who's the most famous person you've ever spoken to other than Rich Roll. Oh. <laughs> um, let's see. I've been doing a lot of nice work with the Surgeon General lately, the Ooh. U.S. Surgeon General. Wow. Um, I, that's probably the most famous person I've had, like, long conversation conversations with. Conversations, yeah. Yeah, I've sort of um, met with, interacted with many famous people. And I won't name names, but I will tell you this. Because teenagers are the great equalizer. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Um, as somebody in the public space who cares from teenager for teenagers, I just want people to know that I have learned that it does not matter how much wealth or power or fame you have. Your thirteen year old is gonna bring you to your knees, and then sometimes they call me, and sometimes I try to be helpful or at least get them in touch with the right resources. So, um, in the name of privacy and dignity, I won't name names, but I just. I do Understood. want to share that, like, uh, working with teenagers means that um, there's nobody who escapes the need for support. Point. Love it. If you could know the answer to any question, what would you ask? What more can we do for teenagers? I think you you're the like one the that answer. you'd have to ask yourself to ask. that question. <laughs> <laughs> you might know the answer. No. Um, all right. Lastly, where would be your favorite place to just be? So open your mm. eyes, open your ears, smells. Mm. Where's your favorite place? I get real, I am really attached to Colorado. I really feel extraordinarily lucky to have grown up there. I, my folks are still there. I visit a lot. Um, I'm, you know, we're having this conversation from my office. Um, those people watching a video can see behind me. I have a <laughs> painting of the front range in my mm -hmm. office. Um, and it's what I look at when I'm taking care of people. Um, it sits behind the couch where my clients sit. Um, 
so for me, the mountains are really powerful. I mean, being up in the mountains, the smells of it, um, I grew up skiing, you know, so that to me feels like a very grounding environment. We had another guest who was talking about that so many people envision the ocean, but really the power of the ocean and how it's just moving and constantly in motion. And really yeah. the mountains are the only place where you can go. And there's truly sort of this like tranquil stillness, which I had never thought about before, yeah. but yeah. it makes a lot of sense to me now. Yeah. Uh, it, it's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to try to cover um, a few main topics we have evolved a little bit since last time we spoke. You know, we started this podcast very heavy in the alcohol and substance use world, and we have, we've expanded out more into a mental health, well-being, performance, longevity, healing kind of space. So we're, we're, just, we're just covering it all now. So um, of all the thousand topics we could cover with you, we're going to try to nar narrow it down to just a few. Uh, but my first question for you would be, Aside from having a tremendous value inside of your, your own parenting world, what is it in the work that you do that gives you the most joy? The thing that gives me pleasure on a couple levels, there's, there's two different ways that it does, is um, translating psychological science for broad use. And so one way I enjoy it a lot is I feel like it's how I can be useful. It is the skill I can bring to the world um, to faithfully bring across what we know as academic and clinical psychologists in a way that is accessible to broad audiences and, um, you know, just is informative, hopefully, and useful to people. So I enjoy it from the standpoint of feeling like this is how I can be helpful. This is the utility I can serve. I will also tell you, I get a great deal of intellectual pleasure out of the um, activity of taking extraordinarily dense content, theoretical material, stuff that's even actually challenging to read as someone within the field. And I, I have almost like a visual sense of like dragging it across um, to tell it in a way that is true, not dumbed down, totally accurate, but engaging and sticky. And um, for me, the intellectual exercise of that is actually a, a real kick. I enjoy wow. that a lot. Wow. That's very cool. Today's episode is sponsored by Athletic Brewing Company, America's leading non-alcoholic craft brewer. Have you been thinking about cutting back on alcohol but still aren't sure if near beers are for you? Check out Athletic Brewing, the most decorated non-alcoholic brewer in the world. Athletic produces a wide selection of great tasting brews, including IPAs, Goldens, Darks, Lights, Sours, and more. Their non-alcoholic beers have won over 70 awards and are fit for all time, so you can drink them anytime and anywhere. Now you can enjoy great tasting craft brews all night long and still be ready for whatever life throws at you tomorrow. Right now, new Athletic customers can receive 20% off their first order when they visit athleticbrewing.com and use the code CP20 at checkout by August 31st, 2023. Um, your brain works different than mine. <laughs> Everybody's works different. Everybody's does. This is what mine does. I'm just trying to make it useful. <laughs> yes, understandable. Um, all right, so the first topic we're going to go kind of broad into the parenting space. Um, and this is, you know, a lot of these things are just me sitting around kind of coming up with things that I want to know, <laughs> you know, this isn't like, all right, let's think what's best for our audience. It's like, I want to know this. And so my question now is state of the world or country society, however we want to narrow it down. Are we in a, in a really tough spot as parents. I mean, I understand that relatively parenting is very hard. <laughs> it always has been, it always will be, but we have a lot of things working against us right now. Would you say it's at a all time high, possibly? I don't know, know that I can say that. Okay. Like I really think about, um, like we recently took a family trip to um, London and um, you know, I was just, looking at all the buildings that were weird 1950s ugly buildings and talking with a friend about, you know, the fact that they were bombing London in the middle of, you know, World War II. And interestingly, um, some of my training is loosely connected to that because children were evacuated out of London and sent without their families to um, Hampstead and other like distal regions 
where Anna Freud, who was Sigmund Freud's daughter, had a nursery to care for young children that were, you know, displaced by the war and developed a lot of theory that has trickled down to me through various forms. So I I don't want to say we're winning the race, some sure. horrible race for how bad parenting can be. Sure. Okay. That, that said, I would let me give you three forces that I think raising kids and especially teenagers right now makes it super hard. One is the true sense of disruption in the world, right? I mean, kids are very aware. Teenagers are deeply aware. The climate stuff is scary. The political stuff is scary. The gun stuff is scary. Teenagers talk about this all the time. We did. I, w- I remember being aware of the Cold War when I was an adolescent, but it felt far away. I don't know. Somehow I could walk away from it. It didn't always seem to be lurking for me. Um, whereas teenagers, I feel these things are persistent in their environment and they're highly aware of them. We have data showing this as well. The American Psychological Association does surveys. Teenagers report to us that they are stressed about these things. So that's one. Related, but also it exp- you know, and it's on, it's in its own right technology, right? Yeah. That part of why kids don't get a break from this and part of why none of us gets a break from this is that we're all just looking at a 24-hour news feed. So even in the midst of the Cold War, I didn't think about it all the time because I was doing other stuff and I wasn't looking at the news. I was thinking about, you know, swim team or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then for teenagers in particular, growing up in a digital environment is really stressful, right? And we could spend hours on that. Mm-hmm. The third thing at work here, and this is something we can do something about, and so that's why I saved it for last. We're not doing a great job of understanding what mental health is and is not. And I think the way that we are talking about it right now is making things feel worse than they have to feel. And what I mean by that is there has become a prevailing view that being mentally healthy means feeling good, which means that people walk around feeling bad all the time because you don't get to feel good all the time. Like, so no, they don't feel bad all the time, but when they feel bad, they feel worse than they probably have to. So I would say my mission in life these days is to try to have us work with an accurate and I think also vastly more reassuring definition of mental health. It's two things. It's having feelings that fit the circumstances you're in and then managing those effectively, managing those feelings effectively. So if your dog dies, you are supposed to be sad. That is not grounds for mental health concern. In fact, that is evidence of your mental health. It would be really (laughs) weird if you weren't sad. If you weren't, right. Yeah. But what we want to know is then what do you do? Do you talk to somebody about your sadness? Do you go for a run? Do you look at pictures of the dog and, you know, have a kind of moment? Or do you go get high? Do you get drunk? Do you give other people a hard time, right? It's that divide that we're watching as psychologists, not the presence or absence of distress. We expect distress. What we're interested in is what happens next. How do people cope under distress conditions? And so I think with this grand misunderstanding that circulates around us about what mental health is and how often being in distress is wrongly equated with having a mental health concern, I think parents and teenagers spend a lot more time, parents and kids and families spend a lot more time freaked out by distress than they need to be. Mm. That makes so much sense. So mm. do you do you do you see whether it's in your office or just in the community of professionals that there are families reaching out panicked about distress? And really when you look at the circumstances, the answers are just sort of like, let's support you a little bit with the management of that, but it's not really actually anything to be overly distressed about. Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Where, you know, my kid is angry, my kid is sad. And then you say, well, tell me what's going on. Well, we're moving, you know, (laughs) in the middle of high school. And you're like, yes, your kid is operating perfectly. Feels lousy for them. Feels lousy for you. How do we help you all cope your way through this? But the presence of the negative feelings on their own are to be expected much of the time. Mm. Oh, man. All right. How in the world do we decide where to go now? <laughs> There's so many places. So I definitely want to cover some of the phone stuff. And I know that's that could be five episodes in itself. But let me put that aside for now. Um, let's go into the mental health space. Um, because, mm. you know, like probably so many you, you talk to, and even in, in, in the podcast world, I, I have a 13-year-old daughter. 
I mean, prime time right the now. The great equalizer of all great <laughs> equalizers, the 13-year-old right. girl. The 13-year-old girl. <laughs> it, it is just, it's a blast. Fortunately, you know, I, I think she does fall into the space that, that you just described where, yes, tough days, tough weeks, tough months, but normal, <laughs> right? And, and, and I guess where I would love to dig in a little more is, is where you started when you named those three things is kind of the state of where we are right now. And there's a lot of fear. And these 13 year olds, these 12, 11, 10 year olds, they're practicing for active shooters. You know, I mean, that would scare me to, that scares me. It would scare anybody. And so you think of a child at a school who's got to go hunker in a hallway just in Reenact or, or acting out in case it would happen. I mean, that is very, very scary. The last few years, diseases, people dying. Don't breathe on your grandmother. She could, you could kill her. You know, I mean, just fear, 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 fear. What does that translate to? Anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so, I guess I want to go back to the normal feelings, and then that mm -hmm. <laughs> is that is that normal. Actually, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, yeah. having an anxiety <laughs> response to having to practice the possibility that an armed person could come into your school and kill lots and lots of people, that is the only rational response. Having an anxiety response to a lethal virus is the only rational response. And in some ways, I would say the climate crisis we're in is actually about a failure of anxiety, right? People have been talking mm, about climate right. for years and years and years, and we did not get sufficiently anxious about it 10 years ago, right? So it's so hard to parent in this context when kids are having the right reaction to forces that feel big and at times beyond our control. You know, there are things we can do. There may be things eventually kids can do, especially as they increasingly move into adulthood and have more say about how we do things as a culture. But um, I don't want to minimize or try to sugarcoat like yeah. these realities. I think what's happening in, in my own experiences is, is, is the anxiety around these things are, are trickling over into anxiety around lots of other things. Mm -hmm. And so there's mm -hmm. that kind of almost traumatic response where she's had some, some heavy anxiety and panic. And so now anytime she gets that little feeling around something that might not be something worthy of a, of a massive attack, it, it goes right into that yeah. because that's the trigger. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what we're dealing with now. No, I could see that, like where the baseline gets very elevated. And then let's just talk for a minute about 13-year-olds and why the girl piece at 13 is maybe amplified. So there's three things that make being 13 very, very hard. One is your feelings are on steroids. And especially given that girls hit puberty a little bit before boys, that 13 window for girls is going to be a time when they are having a very powerful emotional reaction and their neurological development isn't yet in a place to help them quiet it. So that is just the reality of 13. 13-year-olds 13 are also very concrete in their thinking. They can be smart as anything, but they can't always see things from multiple perspectives. So when they get upset, they can stay upset because they can't think their way into another view of the situation. And then the other thing that makes 13 very hard is that they're trying to become their own person. They're trying to become separate. They um, need us and they don't want to need us. Um, they like being like us, they can't stand being like us. It's it's a very, very fraught time that sorts out actually pretty quickly after 13. Once kids develop their own identity, often in high school, often because there's cool stuff they get to do as high schoolers, they can tolerate us a lot better. But it's often a time of very, very high friction with the people who care for you. Um, it's in fact the height of it in many families. So all of this surrounds 13. And then you've got this cultural context that is very destabilizing. So, okay. So, so not to leave us on this like soup of helplessness or <laughs> for 13 year olds. I think that one of our real assets when a kid is having a very hard time is to say, all right, let's just take it all and let's put it in categories, things we can do something about things we can do nothing about. Okay. So right now we're not going to be doing anything about today. We're not going to worry about the political climate, but you are worried about back to school. So let's focus on back to school. 
that is something you can do something about and really, you know, roll up our sleeves on that. So taking things, bringing them down to size for teenagers and not having it all feel like this overwhelming bucket of upsetting things. That was going to be, well, I was going to say, what do we do about, you know, now do we just have these collection of teenagers who are living in this incredibly anxious state that we rationally understand and think is a healthy response, but not a healthy space to live in an extended period of anxiety, right? Like, what do we do to, as communities, as parents, as professionals, what do we do to support those kids? But I think, you know, you started it on that with the break it down. What can we control? What can we not? Um, And then there may be things kids can do. I mean, on the stuff that they care about politically and the stuff that they care about with regard to the environment, like they can take action. Um, Not maybe as much as they wish they could, but they are not entirely helpless in the face of these things. And I think the more that kids can be given a way to try to make change, be part of change, the better they feel. Yeah. Like all of us, right? Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, What about, I mean... This is a bit of an aside maybe from where you are, but I'm curious during COVID and maybe that, you know, nine, 10 year old, that core time where they would be at school dealing with other kids, developing those coping mechanisms. Are you seeing a setback for teenagers with appropriate coping mechanisms for anxiety, for social settings, things like that? Yeah. Yeah. I would say when I, let me just say one thing. First of all, a lot of kids are okay. And and I just want to say that, you know, that so many of the headlines, and of course, this is what headlines are supposed to do. They focus on what's grounds for concern. So many of the headlines are about, you know, worrisome trends, and they are real. And side by side with that, for a lot of kids, when the routines came back, they fell right back into, you know, onto their normal developmental trajectories. They were glad to have them back, you know, have life back. The pandemic was in the rearview mirror. Like, that was a lot of kids. There are two forms of what I would say the long tail of um, the pandemic on development in kids. One is in social skills and um, comfort socializing and, frankly, conflict management. Um, Kids came back from the pandemic worse at conflict management than they were before the pandemic, and they weren't great before the pandemic. So being harsher with one another, um, crueler, more bullying than I had seen in a long time, you know, and um, so they need a lot of support around how to handle disagreements well, around what to do when you don't like somebody, because of course they're going to disagree. Of course they're not going to like somebody, you know, but they need to handle it in a particular way. The other piece, and this is huge and actually grossly underreported, teenagers and kids are using avoidance much more as a go-to strategy for managing anxiety. We have kids not going to school at rates like we have never seen. And why they don't go, it's very different kid to kid. You know, there's a huge range of explanations and it looks different across socioeconomic groups. It looks different regionally, but it is definitely a universal. The kids are not going to school like they used to. The problem with avoidance is that it feels good and it entrenches itself. The day you don't go, you feel tremendous relief. And then you also are further out of the loop. If you're not going to school, right, you're out of loop socially, you're out of loop academically, makes it that much harder to turn around and go back the next day. So then you don't go back. And it's just this, like, it's Mm. as slippery a slope as there is. So that piece around helping kids, um, you know, we call it graduated exposure, wade their way back in, find anxiety management strategies that let them like dip their toe into school and hopefully eventually dive all the way into school. This is really the work to be done in this coming school year. Mm. Man, that, that rings true and, and not just in the school space, but, but lots of events, you know, as, as of course refer back to my situation, but as my daughter is, is seeing, and experiencing new things and new events and new new uh, um, you know things that she's being invited to. There's there's a heightened level of nervousness and anxiety, and sometimes it 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 takes itself to getting sick, and then it's like I can't go, I don't I don't want to go, and then it's like all right, well, what about the next time and the next time? And oh my god, it just the avoidance. I know yep. it well. It's sticky. It is, it is sticky. It really is, and it's it's interesting because the avoidance can be 
you know, translate that over to, um, you know, self-medication or any other kind of coping mechanism or unhealthy coping me mechanism where you're just prolonging and snowballing. Yeah. You know, I drink for anxiety. Well, it just causes more anxiety. Yep. <laughs> right? yep. and then I but in the short more. term, it works oh, great. And that's the problem, right? If it didn't work, people wouldn't do it. And I think that's, it's so reinforcing as a, right. as a choice. Yep. Right. Um, Let's do some technology. Okay. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and, and it, it's just so vast. And, and the way that I kind of think of technology, and, and this is not grounded in, in a bunch of research. It's just my own experiences. But I just look at phones, and handheld phones in particular, and I see two pieces to it. I see the, the, the shiny, the bells and whistles, the noises, the, the graphics, like all the stuff that kind of just draws your senses into and then I see the content, the social media, the texting, the news feeds, the whatever else. And so there's, there's kind of a double whammy of, I don't want to call it negativity because I know that with a healthy balance, this stuff is, is, is great. And there's a reason why we have these things. But take it into a, the level of extremes, then those are, those are not good. How do you want to dig into that? <laughs> So if we think about it from the standpoint of kids, the idea, let's just focus on social media, okay. right? Because that's usually yeah. where, or we'll start with a focus on that. That's usually where there's a lot of friction between parents and kids about what should one do and what the kid wants and what the parent's okay with. Kids need social lives and adolescents need social lives, right? If you could have a kid who is functioning beautifully in every way, but if they do not have friends, that situation's on fire, right? I mean, it's, it's really critical that kids have social lives. And there comes a point where maintaining a social life depends in part on being connected through social media. That is a reality. Now, the goal of the parent, I think, and I'm parenting in this my own self, I have a 19-year-old and a 12-year-old, is to keep an eye on your kid's social life and make sure that they have social connections and are able to maintain social connections and wait as long as possible to bring social media into that milieu. So for a lot of kids who are asking for a phone or saying they need it to stay connected, a lot of times texting will do the job. And it does happen often at, depending on the community in the region, 10, 11, 12, there's suddenly plans are being made by text. And if you do not have access to text, like no one's going to call your home You're phone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's yeah. not going to happen. So start with texting and see how your kid does with texting. And you can give your kid a smartphone that has no browser, no social media apps, that you can only add those things with parental permission and say, here is your text machine that also makes photos <laughs> and you can listen to music on it, right? Yeah. And then see how it's going. If your kid comes to you and says, okay, everything's on Snap now. I can't stay connected without Snap. Take that under advisement, like look at it seriously. And then if you feel your kid has handled texting well, say, okay, we'll consider Snap, right? I mean, that you do it bit by bit by bit in order to maintain in real life social connections. That that it should be supportive of something bigger than just the social media. Um, this is a highly imperfect system. It will not work perfectly for everybody, but it's like a good way to think about it. So there's that piece and just about going as slowly as possible. And what's underneath all of this is that back to that thing I said about 13-year-olds being concrete, a 10, 11, 12, 13-year-old on social media is very different than a 15, 16, 17-year-old on social media. Older teenagers are appropriately much more cynical about what is going on on social media. That cynicism is a useful filter for them, for what they engage. Younger teenagers developmentally don't yet have the perspective maintaining or taking capacities to question what they see as much as it should be questioned. So you're just trying to drive the arrival of social media as late into development for a teenager as makes sense so far as they can maintain a social life. So that's one way to think about it. The other thing I will say about technology is it shouldn't get in the way of stuff that kids need for healthy development. If it, it should not be in anybody's bedroom ever, honestly, but certainly overnight. So it shouldn't disrupt sleep. It shouldn't disrupt physical activity. It shouldn't disrupt being with people in real life. It shouldn't disrupt helping 
around the house or the community, and it shouldn't disrupt schoolwork. So rather than being against technology, be for those things and for technology not getting in the way of those things. So those are a couple things we can say um, yeah. that are sort of broad outlines for how to walk up to this. Got it. I got to go back to the te <laughs> to the texting piece, okay. um, b because often it's 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 um, y you know in, in a specific situation. All right, hey, you've been on your phone for a while. Get off or some or something like that. And it's like I'm just texting. I'm just texting. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't necessarily buy into texting all day long or however <laughs> long you're you're doing it with 25 30 different people and it's just constant da -da 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 like I'm not sure that's good either. Yep. Um so of course and and I know a l often when we ask you questions that that the healthy ba balance narrative is 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 really what we lean into and and I and I I get that that's probably a piece of it um with where I'm going with the texting but I worry a little bit on the same stuff that we deal with as adults with texting, um, not being able to read inflections, emotions, facial expressions, and causing stress, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. misreading based on where I am in my own head. Yeah. I mean, I can read one sentence one day and it's, it's one, it's exciting. And the next day it's, it's daunting. Yeah. How about that in a 13 year old? <laughs> I think the way I would, I agree with you. And I think that the way to think about it is like, it's just stressful. Like it's stressful if you're correctly understanding what's happening just because it's so many kids and so much input and so much activity happening. And it's stressful if you're misunderstanding what's happening, right? Or you're aware of things that are happening that you're not involved in because you're, you know, seeing text threads that <laughs> used to be on. I mean, like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's stressful. It's just a stressful thing. And I think about, so I'm 52. I think about what it was like to go to school all day, go to swimming all afternoon, and then walk in my house and basically be cut off from contact with my friends. Like I could talk to them on the phone as much as I tried to, but at some point like that even was over. And if we had had the technology teenagers have, I promise you, we would use it exactly like they use it. Like I have no question in my mind that we would have <laughs> oh, killed yeah. for that technology. But I also know like how lucky we were just to have that like, break mm -hmm. from one from one's peers and so i think i would frame it more in that like just the dosing issue right it's just so much interaction and kids who go to summer camps who are lucky enough to go to summer camps where they are divorced from their phones like they will talk about it like oh my god it was amazing you know it was amazing to get that break so i would put it if one could in that framework of like you need a break from everybody like whatever you're doing, like you're doing it, you'll do it tomorrow. But like just to not have to be part of that. Yeah. I have a question on this. Yeah, so this is a couple of years ago now. I'm I just I'd totally forgotten about this until you said camp. Mm -hmm. And I knew a couple of families several years ago where the kids would go off to camp and the children would ask the parents to manage their social media while they were gone because they were like, if I don't when I get back. I will be sort of irrelevant. Like I will be eliminated from the friendship group. Now wow. this was, I think pre COVID. <clears throat> so <throat> I'm curious from both of you, I don't have a teenager. So I'm curious from both of you. I mean, are kids excited about that now going to camp where you can't have a phone is the idea of that stressful to them or has something shifted now where they would be really open to that and, it sounds like after the fact, they actually really love it. But do you see anxiety about going away and not having the phone for a period? And what is what's happening there now? I mean, I, I, my initial answer is yes, there's a withdrawal period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can feel free to expand on that. I think so. I mean, I think yeah. it, it's true. And but at the same time, like we kind of have the same thing as adults, oh, yeah. right? You know, I mean, if we go away and we're like, I'm going to put on an out of office, like, do we actually stop checking our email? Like, no. I mean, we're yeah. like, well, let me just see what's there, right? I mean, and yeah. so <laughs> I think um, what we have to appreciate is that it just becomes routinized into one's environment and into one's day. And it becomes a thing one does on impulse when you have a beat or a break. And so- um, I think to be gentle and generous with kids and be like, you know what? I totally get it. 
I put on my out of office. I continue to check my email, like give yourself a couple of days to wind down. You won't miss this as much as you think you will. Like we can extend to them our awareness of how we operate too. Yeah. yeah. And a good check-in for adults too, right? Like what are we modeling? Oh yeah. Where are we being slightly hypocritical potentially? <laughs> Or as my teenage daughters would say, a big fat hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. The, but the interesting thing in the proof, in the evidence, is that after that withdrawal period, for all of us, we all enjoy it and are happier. Yep. There's, there is nobody that goes out there and, and, and actually takes a break from their phone and comes back more miserable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so then the question becomes like, how do we build this into the routines of family life so we're not springing it on? kids. And this is where I just, I, I feel very strongly, like phones don't go in bedrooms. Um, there's no reason for it. Like there's no good reason for it. And so, you know, by the time it's time for a kid to go to bed, like the phone should be somewhere else. And so even there is a break that a lot of kids are not getting. Mm, yeah. And that's something you're doing as adults in your home too. I have done that with both of my kids from the jump. And I will tell you, it's a much easier rule to put in place if you start there when your kid gets technology and if you yourself observe it. And so this is like, you know, there's not a lot of advantages to being a psychologist parent, but this is one. Like I knew to do this um, with my kid who's now almost 20. Um, but if you have listeners who are like, yeah, lady, that ship has sailed. You know, what I would say is, you know, say to your teenager, Say to your kid, you know what? Sleep is the glue that holds us together. It is absolutely critical to mental health. We are taking the phones out of our room. We're going to take the phones out of your room. There are data showing that you do not sleep as well in a room with a phone in it, even while you are asleep. So we're going to charge them all over here. And then your kid's going to go, wait, wait, it's my alarm. It's my um, music player. And you're going to say, if you have the resources, we got you this lovely Alexa. <laughs> meet your new alarm, meet your new you know, music player. Like, I don't care if they have that kind of tech in their room. It is not connected to every single person they know. Um, it's a, I think this is a fight worth having. Is, I'm, and I don't know if the science would have, or the, you know, research would have been there before, but when we used to have, you know, a regular, tele, like a house phone mm -hmm. in my head. So maybe this is, I guess, I think I'm, in the millennial category and panic induced thinking that no one in my family has a phone available in the middle of the night. If there's a crisis, like oh. if my parents have a crisis and they need to call for some help for, you know, and none of their adult children will answer something like that, that panics me. So is there research? I mean, are, I'm, I'm curious how to combat that or how to build a solution for the future. I mean, do we make a comeback of house phones? that are like nighttime only emergency lines <laughs> or, yeah. you know, really, I, cause yeah, it's I a fair question. It's a fair question. That, um, we actually still have a landline and it almost never rings, but if it rang in the middle of the night, I would get up. Yeah. Okay. I, I think yeah. I would, hmm. honestly, I, that would be such a, a, such a reassurance for me, not yeah. having a phone in my room. If I knew like the house phone will ring if there's a crisis. Yeah. If there's a crisis. Yeah. That's, that's the place. That's interesting. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's a really we don't a have personal a note, but I'm just very, I'm always anxious when I think about that for that exact reason, uh -huh. but I can see... It's so easy when you look at from the outside, right? Like for a teenager thinking like, of course you're going to sleep better if this phone isn't in your room. But then all of a sudden I find myself as an adult being like, but I need it for this and I need it for this. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's now you can silence everybody, but your parents or, yeah, or right, someone is, that yeah, might, exactly. that you're concerned. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. In the spirit of time, let's shift. Um, and this is once again, just a per personal curiosity. Um, but when we look at the division in our country, call it political, yeah, we'll just call it political division. And I notice that, golly, I don't know how to go about this. I guess my question is, is what we're modeling for our kids? Because I think our kids are, they're much less racist. They're much less sexist. You know, they're very accepting of, of, of different kinds of people and, and, and people from different places and, and, and people that look differently. What I'm concerned about is that, and I've seen this in, in my own child's groups, um, oh, that, that person's family likes Trump mm -hmm. or that person's mm -hmm. family does this. And so there, there's an, this automatic judgment. There's this mm -hmm. automatic 
uh, criticism and, and inacceptance or, or mm-hmm. unacceptance of someone based on beliefs and ideas. Yeah. yeah. No, it's um, what you said about modeling, right, is really important. And to tie it back to what I was saying, like kids are showing back up at school handling conflict really poorly. Well, if you look in the news, like they can see lots and lots of examples of adult, adults handling conflict really poorly. And so when we think about how we help kids manage conflict well. I mean, I think that what we want to say is like, you don't have to, you're not going to agree with everybody. You're not going to agree with other everybody's beliefs. Um, all people deserve to be treated with dignity and all people deserve your respect. Like they do. And like, you need to try to understand where other people are coming from, especially if you don't agree with them. Because if you want to try to change how they think, you're going to have to try to understand how they think, right? You're going to want to try to understand why they hold views that feel so different from what makes sense to you. So like we need to push ourselves to understand people who um, don't see the world the way we do. That's how we're going to find common ground if there is common ground to be had. That's how we're going to make change if we feel changes need to occur. Um, But we got to be really careful about how we talk as adults because kids are just going to pick it right up and mimic it. Yeah. What was the thing you said earlier? Is it? Yeah. So I was telling Robbie that um, (laughs) when I was in grad school, a peer wrote a wonderful paper that changed my perspective forever. Um, But essentially what she said was intolerance of intolerance is still intolerance. Mm -hmm. And I think as people, (laughs) when we, if you consider yourself a pretty open-minded person or somebody who advocates for people who are not often, you know, represented in any, anything like that, which I think a lot of teenagers really value. It's so easy to forget that being intolerant of intolerance is still putting you in the intolerant category. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, the extremes are dangerous. They are, yeah. It doesn't so matter which something. extreme you're at. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's do a touch on drugs and alcohol, just because we have kind of done that already with you, but we want to give our listeners what they what they need and what they want. You have a 19-year-old. If you're mm-hmm. open to this, when did you start talking to them mm-hmm. about it? Mm-hmm. Prevention, mm-hmm. um, you know, peer pressure, experimentation. How are you guiding your 19-year-old back when they were at the age mm-hmm. of beginning those phases? I remember exactly how it came up. Um, it was when she was in the eighth grade, and there was a rumor, I don't know if it was true or not, that um, other eighth graders were eating weed gummies. So she brought that rumor home. And again, rare moment where being a psychologist is an advantage. I was like, whoa, tell me more, you know? And and so much of the good conversations we have with teenagers is when they bring up the topic and they're bringing up about somebody else because the door is open, but you're not like, you know, your kid's not in the hot seat. And I then took that opportunity to say, you know, gosh, that makes me so worried for them from the neurological standpoint. They are in a critical phase of brain development. Um, that window's open at least till they're 24 years old. And, you know, messing with weed at the at the age you're at could have really lasting implications. And um, she was interested in that. And I said, do they seem fuzzy to you? And she said, yes, like they seem fuzzy. I'm like, that's that's what happens, right? So we were able to draw on what she was seeing. And so the principles at work here, and I'm not so sure I had them fully articulated in my mind when I was using them, is that don't focus on like right, wrong, law, moral judgments, focus on health and safety, right? That this is a safety question. Because, you know, if you focus on right, wrong or getting caught, like the kids are like, oh, just don't get caught, right? But if you focus on questions of like neurological development, health, safety, it doesn't matter if the grownups ever catch on. It's still an issue for the kid. And so I think that's an important place to put it. And I think the other thing is to the degree when kids bring up stuff around, you know, drugs or alcohol, to try to be curious about why they're bringing it up, interested, ask questions, say, what do you think, as opposed to taking that moment to come down like a ton of bricks, because I think that's a lost opportunity. So a kid comes home and, uh, or how about they don't bring it to you? They get Mm. caught. They get caught. Mm -hmm. So if they get caught, I think, again, you could quickly pivot it. It's not about getting caught. You say, look, I caught you. And I I say to kids all the time, very rare that adults are going to catch you. It's very hard to catch you. 
Um, and then I would very quickly say, but look, I mean, there may be consequences. We'll figure it out. But like you getting caught is the least of your concerns. What I want you to focus on is whether or not you're going to get hurt. And the reason this is an issue is that you are going to get hurt either neurologically or something bad's going to happen because you're high or drunk. And so this is not that I hate fun. This is that I love you. This way of having fun stands to really harm you, whether I ever find out or not. Mm. Yep. Yep. Last time you were on, you talked very heavily about safety. Mm -hmm. It's about safety. That's that's why we don't want kids doing these things. And I think there's so many other things that can be distractions. Safety goes with your kid everywhere your kid goes. Whether you know what they're up to or not, they are responsible for their safety. Make it about safety. I'm okay. just laughing. Like, like this would have worked like a charm on me as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> to this day still, you know? Like, Nothing worked on me. Oh, God, that's terrifying. <laughs> um, okay, well, I have I have a question that we, we, you know, hadn't really chatted about, but in listening to you all talk today, stressful time to be a teenager. Lots of kids doing okay, but stressful mm -hmm. time to be a teenager. Stressful time to be a parent. Mm -hmm. Watching people you love go through something that's traumatic and stressful is hard. So are you seeing that arise in parents' anxiety mm -hmm. arise? And what are the resources or the support that you recommend to the parents who are dealing with this sort of traumatic process? Yeah. Um, it is an extraordinarily hard time to be a parent. And I will say the pandemic was incredibly hard on kids and teenagers. It was incredibly hard on parents. And I don't think I could say enough about how emotionally taxing it has been to be a parent in recent years, and it is in general. What I will say is I want parents to be gentle with themselves and to have fair expectations for what they're supposed to do when their kid is having a super hard time. And I'm going to say two words, and this is all I want parents to try to do, and it's going to sound simple. It's actually not easy to do. I want them to try to be a steady presence. That's what kids need more than anything else. You often can't fix it. You can't make it go away. You can't walk it back. But if you can be a steady presence when your kid is having a very hard time, that almost always gives your kid exactly what they need. Mm. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely. All right. Um, Dr. Damore, thank you so much. We have... We always save the best for last. People think they're they're wrapping up, and then we ask this question, and they're like, "Oh God!" Uh, but uh, so the fi final question that we like to ask our guests, and it's a power question, and I think we started this actually after you came on the other time. But the question is, Doctor Lisa Demore, why do you care? I get to be in a profession that is about relationships, that is about helping people make meaningful connection with other people, and. In the whole universe of things that are curative, things that are therapeutic, things that help people manage the world, it all comes down to relationships. So what I care about is relationships, and I care about them because I know they are the most therapeutic thing we have going. Lovely. I love that. Thank you for that. And thank, thank you. you for coming on. Thank, thank you for you. everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure. The information and opinions shared on this podcast are solely those of the host and guests and are not a substitute for medical advice. If you feel like you may need professional help, here are some resources. Visit Patrick Balsley's practice, saunacounseling.com, Robbie Shaw's practice, eventiderecovery.com, or visit theblanchardinstitute.com. <laughs>